Hello learners, Namaste. Welcome back to the course on Labor Welfare and Industrial Relations. We move to the last lecture of the Module 4 where we look into Social Security specifically based on a convention of ILO number 102. I am Dr. Abraham Sirlisak. I am an assistant professor at the School of Business, Indian Institute of Technology, Guwahati. So we have discussed extensively about Social Security. In the previous lecture, if you have seen, we have looked into the relevance, the evolution of Social Security specifically, what was the historical background in which Social Security have emerged and why uh, the need for Social Security was there and what are the different important acts with respect to social security. So today we will we'll extend our understanding. This is where even in my introduction video I mentioned that I will go beyond the syllabus, I will try to bring in something which is happening at the international forum, what we are supposed to uh, subscribe to, all these important aspects also I will try to include and as part of that I am trying to include number 102, the convention of ILO. So Social Security Minimum Standards Convention number 102, that's what we will look into today in greater detail. It was adopted by International Labor Conference on 28 June 1952. It is the flagship of all ILO Social Security Conventions. Please remember that. The only international instrument based on uh, basic Social Security principles that establishes worldwide agreed minimum standards of all nine branches of social security. What are the nine branches of social security? Let's have a quick look, look into that. Nine branches of social security. Please note, ladies and gentlemen, there are different aspects of social security we have tried to assimilate over uh, different lectures in this module. But here I would like to give you an exhaustive list given by ILO which concerns with the nine branches of security. The first one is medical care. Every single employer, every single organization should take the medical care seriously as part of the social welfare measures. The second is sickness benefit. The third is unemployment benefit. Fourth is old age benefit. Fifth is employment injury benefit. Employment injury benefit or employee injury benefit to a certain extent. Sixth, family benefit. The employer has to take care of the organization, has to take care of the family also, which becomes very critical. Maternity benefit, we have discussed it as part of the Maternity Benefits Act also. Invalidity benefit and finally survivor's benefit. So these are the nine branches of social security according to ILO and I just wanted to detail uh, the list of the entire uh, set of uh, social security measures. We have touched upon most of it in different contexts but when you look into the ILO convention specifically, these are the nine branches of social security. When you look into convention number 102, it specifies how the systems are to be set up. Let's look into that. When you look into the system, what circumstances each branch is meant to protect, who should be protected, what type of benefit should be provided while the entire system is working and how do persons become eligible for the benefits and finally, for how long? for how long the benefit should be granted. So when you look into the convention number 102, it specifies how the systems are to be set up by these five measures. What circumstances, who, what type of benefit, how do persons become eligible for that and for how long the benefit should be granted. So let's look into the minimum standards for determining rates of this benefit. Uh, this is again just a heuristic or just measure uh, and it need not be exactly implemented but these are the principles on which the policies are drafted. When it comes to the standard beneficiary, uh, sickness, man with wife and two children, Employment injury, incapacity for work, man with wife and two children, 50% would be the indicated percentage. Uh, disablement, man with wife and two children. Survivors, widow with two children. Maternity, women. Invalidity, man with wife and two children. Survivors, widow with two children. So these are the indicated percentages when, when we look into the, the convention minimum standards for determining rates for benefit. Now when you look into the minimum content of a medical care program, so you cannot simply float any medical care program. As the law suggests, you need to have a medical care program. So our company is uh, giving one. Now that should not be the reason or that could not be the reason why uh, you know a medical care program will come and I am not sure that whether that will actually look into or uh, cater to the entire needs of the worker. 
So that is why there should be a specific uh, mention of the minimum content of a medical care program and that is what is critically underscored by this convention. When you look into that specifically we have the general practitioner care as the first point including home visit that would come in the minimum content of a medical care program. We have the specialist care in hospitals and similar institutions for inpatients and outpatients specifically in the minimum content of a medical care program. We will have the essential pharmaceutical supplies uh, that will come in the minimum content. We would also have the prenatal confinement and postnatal care by medical practitioners or qualified midwives. Please note qualified uh, midwives. This would be also part of uh, the minimum content of a medical care program. And finally, hospitalization. Hospitalization wherever necessary. So, in the maternity benefit brand specifically, the medical care element should include items 4 and 5 of this uh, particular list specifically it has been mentioned. So, these are certain minimum standards or minimum content or minimum standards for medical care that should be there when an organization is coming up with such a program. When you look into the medical benefit specifically, the insured person and his or her family members, let us say, become eligible for full medical Medical care from the day he or she enters into the insurable employment specifically. So there is absolutely no ceiling on the expenditure incurred towards the treatment of an insured person or family member. Medical care is also provided to retired and permanently disabled persons and the spouses uh, on payment of a uh, premium of rupees 120. So they are also not you know disbanded, they are also not considered, they are also part of the entire medical system that is why uh, you know with a premium being paid, a nominal premium being paid, uh, they, they are also taken into consideration. When you look into the maternity benefit specifically, it maternity benefit is payable for 3 months during the confinement of the pregnancy specifically. It can be extended for one month based on the medical advice that is being provided and the insured person, please note, the insured person receives full wages during the period subject to contribution for 70 days in the preceding year. So, the person if he has contributed, she has contributed 70 days, then subject to that, definitely the insured person receives full wages during the period. That is what is more critical when it comes to Maternity Benefit Act. When you look into the Sickness Benefit Act, you should look go into the detail. A worker, specifically when you look into the Sickness Benefit, a worker has to contribute 78 days in a 6 month uh, contribution period to actually become eligible for the sickness benefit. So, it is a form of uh, cash compensation. It is a form of cash compensation at rate of 70 percentage of uh, the specific uh, wages payable for a maximum period of 91 days uh, per year in a year uh, aspect to the insured person during the period of uh, certified sickness. Please note, it is with respect to certified sickness and this is to prevent uh, any exploitation or any abuse of uh, the package or the abuse of such uh, policies that otherwise would be there to facilitate a healthy environment within the workplace. So, in case of extended sickness benefits, we see that sickness benefit is extended up to 2 years in case of 34 long term diseases and the insured person specifically is paid at the rate of 80 percent of wages. When the insured person specifically undergoes sterilization, 7 days for men and 14 days for women, enhanced the sickness benefit equivalent to full wages is paid to him or her. So, these are the sickness benefit details which uh, comes under uh, the particular policy. When you look into the uh, dependence benefit paid at the rate of 90 percent of the wage uh, in the form of monthly payment to the dependent of the deceased insurance insured person and rupees 10,000 is paid as funeral expenses. So, this is also taken care of in the dependence benefit part. When you look into the disablement benefit specifically, when you look into the dependence benefit again, uh, in spite of all these facilities there have been uh, you know different aspects that will be uh, still having a lack and you are still having some shortcoming. Disablement benefit, disablement benefit is typically different. 
the insured person is eligible for temporary disablement benefit from the day of entering insurable employment irrespective of payment of any contribution in case of employment injury. So 90% of wage can be paid as temporary disablement benefit as long as the disability uh, specifically continues. In the case of permanent disability, in the case of permanent disability or disablement benefit, it is paid at the rate of 90% of a wage in the form of monthly payment depending upon the loss of earning capacity which has to be certified specifically by a medical board. So what we have understood with these uh, typical measures, benefit measures and benefit schemes is that there are a lot of provisions be it for dependent, be it for disablement, be it for sickness, be it for healthcare. In spite of all these facilities, in spite of all these facilities there have been many complaints about the poor quality of medicines available under this scheme. Inadequate medical care and delay in the payment of cash benefits is also a concern that has come up of late. So employers are of the opinion that the provision of a leave specifically encourages malingering and absenteeism. That's what the employer specifically uh, says. They have their own concerns there. Though the administration and finances of the scheme need to be improved, it has to be an important step ahead in the sphere of the entire medical welfare. So when you look into the act, specifically the policy or the law recommendation from ILO, we have to also look into the social protection floors recommendation 2012 which is known as a number 202, the most recently adopted ILO social security standard which expands the normative framework for the extension of social security by introducing the concept of nationally defined social protection floor. Nationally defined social protection floors that guarantee at least access to essential health care and basic income security throughout the life course. So specifically when you look into the recommendation number 202 is the first international instrument to specifically offer guidance to countries to close social security gaps and progressively achieve universal protection through the establishment and maintenance of comprehensive social security systems. When you look into uh, the particular recommendation number 202, the recommendation calls for uh, A, the implementation as a, a top priority of social protection floor as a fundamental element of national social security systems and as a starting point for the countries that do not have a minimum level of pro social protection and B, the extension of social security with a view of progressively ensuring higher levels of social security as too many people as possible according to the national fiscal and economic capacity and as guided by the previous convention number 102 and other ILO social security standards specifically. So one thing I would like to mention here is that the social protection flow recommendation 2012 number 202 expands the normative framework for the extension of social security by expanding the concept of nationally defined social protection floor and it guarantees at least access to essential health care and as mentioned the basic economic security throughout the life course. So this has to be one of the most critical achievement to offer guidance to countries to close social security gaps and progressively achieve universal protection throughout the establishment of the social security. So when you look into uh, these two recommendations closely what we have seen is that they have they are underscoring a typical important update on what otherwise would be missed out by the employer intentionally or unintentionally but you need to have a basic standard that is what these two resolutions actually or recommendations actually encourage to have when you look into the social uh, protection flows recommendation 2012 more deeply it has four basic social security guarantees and these include access to essential health care access to essential health care basic income security for children persons of active age who are unable to earn sufficient income again and older persons and should be set at a level that allows people to live with dignity. So please note that the, the social protection flows recommendation 2012 goes one step beyond and tries to give back the dignity that every single worker otherwise 
commands. So through, through the social protection flows concept, recommendation number 202 provides the minimum core content of the human right to the social security and a major achievement of recommendation number 202 is the policy guidance it offers states to give effect to their general and overall responsibility to establish and maintain these comprehensive social security systems. So these guideline, these guiding principles intentionally echo two aspects, both fundamental human right principles, fundamental human right also core principles related to good governance. So these are the two important aspects that are taken care of when you are looking into the social protection flows recommendation 2012 and the previous recommendation. So what we have seen is basically that there are certain acts and there could be some provisions with respect to acts which are good enough for the company or for the employer but there are certain provisions that employers might sometimes intentionally or unintentionally miss out. So to prevent any such uh, abuse if there are that is why these ILO provisions are there. It gives a basic charter, it gives a basic understanding of where or how the social security benefits should be actually designed. Please note there are two important aspects I just concluded. One is the fundamental human right principles. Every single individual, every single worker has the right to actually perform in, with certain dignity. Putting back or giving back the dignity to the worker in the workplace that is what the significant aspect here is. And second is all these aspects are in line with giving way to the good governance aspect. So mainly we can say good governance practices, best management practices, but unless and until you are giving basic HR or human right practices within the workplace, within the workspace, these things will not lead to good governance. That would be the entire completion of module 4. We'll go into greater detail of welfare into module 5 where we'll look into greater details of uh, specifically welfare activities and other acts and laws. Till then, take care. Bye-bye.